Now, at lunchtime, Claire approached me and said that there are people in the audience who don't have English as a first language and they're struggling to uh, understand people because they're speaking too quickly. I had no idea that why <laughs> she decided to approach the Scotsman. The good bit is, though, I'm from Glasgow and English is not my first language either. <laughs> so, as retrievalists, this pre-hospital scene is the type that we all aspire to. It's calm, it's controlled, it's safe, and effective clinical care is flowing. The performance of this team is following the Yerkes dodson stress performance curve. As the cognitive load and the stress increases on that team, their performance is increasing. They're becoming more stimulated, more aroused until they get to that sweet spot of optimal performance. And that is a good place to be, and that is why we, as retrievalists, do our job. But there's a problem. Our cognitive capacity is limited, and it's easy for us to become overloaded and for our performance to become compromised. And we can become so cognitively overloaded that we actually become unsafe. This is a pre-hospital scene with a team from Glasgow 30 years ago who have become so cognitively overloaded that clinical care is compromised and safety at that scene is compromised. Now, some performance psychologists in Scotland have developed a very technical and scientific term for this. <laughs> so what we want to do with our teams is we want to keep them on the left side of the curve before they get to the patient, so when they do reach the patient, they can move into that sweet spot. So we need systems that keep them on the left side of the curve, and if they do move into the right side of the curve, to get them back into the sweet spot. So ideally, we want our teams with a completely clear cognitive bandwidth, a full capacity when they reach the patient to use all of that cognitive capacity to think about the nuances and the clinical challenges of that individual patient. But unfortunately, if we've got poorly organized systems, a lot of our teams have got a lot to think about even before they get to the patient, and it's inevitable once they get there they're going to be overloaded and performance is going to be compromised. So what can we do? The problem is, is that every retrieval is unpredictable, and therefore cognitive overload is a huge risk. But every unpredictable retrieval is made up of predictable recurring components. So if we can identify those predictable components and carefully plan for them and practice them and perfect the predictable, it allows us to do the unpredictable safely and efficiently. So what can we do? Absolutely, we can simulate, but put emphasis on drilling. Look at your set pieces, pre-hospital anesthesia, blood transfusion, packaging, and turn those into system one, intuitive, automatic thinking that doesn't take up a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> Give our team standard operating procedures and guidelines, but don't just write them for the sake of writing them. They need to be short, they need to be didactic, and they need to be unambiguous. And when you're writing them, think of the least experienced member of your team at two o'clock in the morning when they are performing under pressure. We need to give people access to cognitive aids, especially for high-risk procedures that are done uncommonly. Our services might be picking up patients from dozens of referral centers and taking them to numerous hospitals to receive definitive care. Each of those have got different clinical capabilities, different landing sites, different phone numbers. That can easily cognitively offload us. Giving our teams access to electronic location guides can be hugely helpful. Cognitive aids for numerical calculations. Cognitive aids for pieces of equipment that are not intuitive. Cognitive aids for pieces of equipment that fail how to troubleshoot them. And for sudden patient deterioration in the same way that pilots have caption cards. And we are never more cognitively or emotionally overloaded than at multiple casualty major incidents. Writing roll cards that we can give to individual members of our team to get them to switch on and know what their role is are hugely effective in offloading. 
We can't have enough checklists in pre-hospital care and retrieval medicine. These evidence shows these reduce stress, they reduce risk, and it makes sure that everyone has the same mental model. So we've all got pre-procedural checklists. What about readiness state checklists at the start of a shift when you're going out the door to the job? What about care bundle checklists for our set pieces of sepsis, those patients requiring neuroprotection? Ready to go checklists. Are we safe and is the patient safe to leave the scene? Especially for leaders of retrieval teams, delegation is the most effective way to offload yourself. But we need to make sure that the people we are delegating to have got the competence to make those decisions and undertake those tasks. So we need clarity about competencies within the full team, and we need robust ways of assessing that competence so that we can delegate safely. We need to sharpen our saws and not give guys the wrong tools that are poorly organized. We need to give them pre-filled syringes. We need to give them backup equipment for equipment failure. We all know how easily trying to find a piece of equipment, a bag or sorts of equipment failure out can overload us and lead to harm. Our teams need to have insight and knowledge about how problems with communication and behavior can put us onto the right side of the curve. And similarly, they need to have solutions through communication and behavior that are going to bring us back into that sweet spot of optimal performance. We need to control our environment. Darkness, heat, cold, even midges, feeling unsafe can add to stress and can push us rightwards. And this is in Scotland, we invest a lot in giving our guys the right personal protective equipment for optimal performance. <laughs> People come to work with a lot of cognitive baggage, and that is not good for when they actually go out there and deal with a patient. We're quite happy with pilots having stereo cockpits, removing unnecessary communication information um, <clears throat> to prevent error during takeoff and landing. We should maybe adopt the concept of having a sterile retrieval shift and getting rid of all that baggage. Decent systems have got centralized remote decision support and transport coordination to offload our teams. And we also need to look at high performing teams and their marginal gains for improving performance. Giving people electronic access to easy ways of reporting significant events so we can learn from them. And badge camera film, we found this hugely helpful in looking at our systems and our behaviors and how we can improve. So all of these things, putting into our systems to keep our team safe and our patients safe to move us to the left side of the curve. But what happens if we do become overloaded? How do we get ourselves out of there? That's pretty straightforward. We need to calm down. We need to control our breathing and bring us back from that sympathetic overdrive. We need to articulate and tell the team that I am overloaded at the moment. We need to physically make a list of issues and prioritize actions. We need to make sure that the full team has got the same mental model. We need to delegate. We need to take time out, even for a minute, to reframe. We need to outsource decision making and we need to make sure that we're well hydrated and we've got enough caffeine and carbohydrate on board. So we can plan, practice, and perfect the predictable. But as Mike Tyson says, we need to be ready for the unpredictable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>Stephen Harns, can you riff more on marginal gains? So which marginal gains that you've employed in your service have had or translated into the greatest changes in patient outcomes? Um, really, particularly with regard to RSI, we're actually only permitted at the moment to film emergency anesthesia. Um, and with regard to organization of equipment, moving on to pre-filled syringes, um, we've actually managed to save eight minutes uh, on scene for every emergency anesthetic by having um, dedicated uh, the way we've laid out of equipment and moving on to pre-filled syringes. So does that mean uh, every intubation is with ketamine? 
Uh, just about. <laughs> <laughs>